Well, it's good to uh, see such a good turnout this evening. Welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, I've got a legal pad that I started over here and over here because, you know, there are people from different classes. So, you know, you want your professor to know you were here. So we appreciate you signing up for that. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Smedra and Dr. Smith for participating in this very important um, seminar forum um, on the global economic crisis and its impact on the third world. And um, so I think we're going to learn a lot. In fact, I know tonight about what caused it and, uh, you know, just, just maybe the impact on what we can do, what can be done to um, solve, you know, some of the problems. Um, this is, for some of you, it might be your first seminar, but for others, you're familiar with it. Uh, at least for three and a half years, probably four years. It actually goes back to 1981. And uh, incidentally, my name is Dr. Harold Isaacs. And, uh, I was here in 1981, and in fact, even before. And um, I started this series back then, and then we've had a lot of uh, offshoots from it. Uh, the Third World Association, Association Third World Studies, which uh, was founded in 1983, and then the Journal of Third World Studies, 1984. Um, let me say this, we'll have another seminar Wednesday, March 25th. It'll be on Russia and the near abroad, and it'll feature Dr. Richard Hall, Professor of History, and uh, Brian Parkinson, uh, Dr. Brian Parkinson, uh, assistant professor of history, and they're going to talk about Russia and Central Asia and Russia and the Caucasus. Caucasus. And so uh, we invite you. You got my invitation to that. Um, we um, Monday. A uh, tragic event occurred, as most, as most of you know. Um, Millard Furler uh, passed away. And um, I want to just extend our sympathy to, um, to Linda and, and the children. It's, uh, it's really a great loss. Uh, we worked with Millard in the early stages of third world studies out here. And uh, in fact, at the first meeting of the Association of Third World Studies, most of the people that attended were from Habitat for Humanity. And Millard, Millard required them to be here. He said, or else. And, uh, you know, he just, <clears throat> just did so much for uh, people that needed help here and also in the third world where actually he, he started the house building project in Zaire and uh, so so we we want to just convey um, our condolences uh, and sympathy to the Fuller family and really everybody that, that knew him um, now um, this evening, I, I see we have some people here. I always introduce people who from the college, and I try not to forget anyone. I welcome all the students first. You're first. Without you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so, um, uh, with Dr. Gary Klein, right over here, is head of the History and Political Science Department, and Paula Martin, she's in the History Department, and Dr. Hall, uh, of course, is in the History Department. Uh, my wife is right here, Doris. She's not in the history department. <laughs> Anyhow, 
Uh, Donna Barger, uh, right here in the third row with her husband, R.D. David Garrison. Thank you. And uh, what, what is your name, sir? Uh, Jim Favre and my wife, Margaret. Okay. We're actually, uh, associate, yeah, we're from the Fuller Center. Oh. Okay, I, I think I met you down there. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you, you coming out. Thank you. That was just... Uh, Thank you for the tribute. Okay, well, uh, well, well deserved. Uh, that was just about a month ago, just a little over a month ago. Uh, well, this evening, of course, is a very relevant topic. Um, global financial crisis and its impact on the third world and our first speaker <clears throat> is Dr. Philip Smedra, who um, is an authority on development economics and agricultural economics, got his degree, um, undergraduate degree from Penn State University, MA, PhD from the University of Georgia. So he saw the light. And um, worked for the department uh, of agriculture, as this, this kid Phil. He's taught at various universities, including the University of the Pacific. He's been very active in uh, the academic community. He's um, um, on the uh, board of directors of the Georgia Consortium and he's um, on the editorial staff of the Journal of Third World Studies. He runs, uh, supervises study abroad programs, and in fact, uh, his forthcoming uh, program is GSW Maymester Study Abroad Program in Bulgaria, which is gonna be held at the American University in Bulgaria May 10th to June 10th, 2009. And he's done a lot of research, on-site research in the South Pacific uh, on diabetes and um, other types of diseases affecting people um, in that region. And he's taught many courses on um, international economics and so forth. And Dr. Smedra is Associate Professor of Economics. He's going to be our, full, our, our uh, featured speaker. And then Dr. Smith will respond uh, give a response to Dr. Smender's presentation. So join me for, uh, to welcome Dr. Smender for, I think about the 12th time or something like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, do you folks want to like sit um, down here or up here? Because I'm, I'm going to be talking for a tremendously long time. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Isaacs for inviting me to talk and for putting these programs together that are, I think, very important. Um, tells us kind of what's going on in the developing world, and I'm looking forward to uh, next month's presentation on, on Russia and the, uh, what is it, the Near East? Near abroad. Near abroad. Central Asia. Right. That'll be exciting. <coughs> So what an exciting time to um, essentially be alive, isn't it? Uh, we ha are going through something that the United States uh, hasn't seen since the Great Depression. We've had about four generations of Americans who have not experienced what we're experiencing now. And um, from the time that I've been studying economics, which is about 45 years now, which is a long time, uh, this is just a revelation. It's exciting to, to wake up every morning, listen to the news, and listen to the latest catastrophe that's befallen markets. Um, how much money it's going to take to right the wrongs that have uh, occurred uh, in, in, in 2008, and what the new administration, what an exciting time to be a new president also. Um, I wonder what he feels like every morning when he gets up. Mm -hmm. 
So, an exciting time to be alive, uh, an exciting time to be a student of economics. And those of you who are my students here, um, you're very, very fortunate uh, to be living in a time when uh, things are in turmoil, when economic systems, when economic markets are in turmoil. One of the dangers of what's, what's occurring right now is that we will um, reevaluate the, uh, the market system and wonder whether, in fact, we want to make some changes to that market system. And I'm here to tell you that that probably would be a mistake. <laughs> What's occurred, what occurred in 2008, uh, was essentially a market failure. And for those of you who um, have had me for microeconomics, we talk about market failure. And we talk about the rightful place of government in market failure. Government has a role to play when markets fail. So I expect that the Obama administration will do something about the market failure that's occurred in the capitalist market they, that, we, that we operate in. But the danger is that we throw out the good things that have provided us with prosperity, both in the United States and the Western world and also in the developing world. We have to make sure that we don't throw out the good things along with the bad things. The good things that this, this system, this capitalist system that every country in the world now has adopted, except for a couple of outliers like Cuba, and Cuba will adopt it as soon as Mr. Castro goes away. Uh, that'll happen shortly. Um, North Korea. You go figure North Korea. I haven't been able to figure out North Korea, nor has anybody else. But they'll adopt uh, capitalism, market ca capitalism, sometime soon. And so will Laos, and so will the other uh, countries that call themselves communist. China uh, saw the light about 30 years ago. And China now is a much more capitalist country than we are, uh, kind of a Wild West capitalism. But again, we want to make sure that we don't throw out the good things of market capitalism when we reevaluate the system and throw out the bad things. All the system needs in order to right itself is a little bit more oversight. And that's what occurred uh, last year and the year before. Not enough oversight in our financial markets. But understand the system of market capitalism has, has provided us both in the Western world and the developing world, with a level of prosperity that the world has never seen before. Capitalism is good. It's provided prosperity, as I mentioned, to billions of people. It's brought people in China, in India, and in other developing countries out of abject poverty into a middle class. 500 million people in China into a middle class. Now, there's still about 800 million of them uh, living in abject poverty, but given enough time, those folks will be driven, will be brought into a middle class. What the current system, the current globalized market system has done, has integrated all the economies, essentially all the economies in the world. Half the world's population now has become a participant in the global market economy. We have tremendous more laborers in the economy than we had before. And what that's done is caused the developing world to essentially import deflation. The integration of uh, literally billions of people into world labor markets has caused prices of goods that we buy to be much lower than they would have been if those people weren't integrated in global labor, mar labor markets. And therefore, we as a Western society and people in the developing world have become richer as a result. Now, a bit of the market failure. Um, because of cheap prices and because of very low interest rates, uh, we in the West, especially in the United States, um, provided cheap interest to individuals who probably didn't deserve uh, cheap mortgages. And we uh, provided these cheap mortgages, uh, provided free credit, essentially free credit to individuals who didn't merit that free credit. Um, a way that the entire world shared in this system, everybody wanted a piece of the American real estate market because everybody thought that the American real estate market was going to go up and up and up and up without any kind of a stop. But uh, just, it's a simple case of supply and demand. Um, many more houses were created because 
housing prices continued to increase and therefore builders thought that this market was um, unstoppable and so we have an oversupply of houses which from your basic principles of macroeconomics you know that when there's too much supply and not enough demand prices go down and that's what's happened overall prices of houses in the United States have gone down by 20 percent over the past year um, that's caused these strange financial instruments that have been created in order to take advantage of uh, the housing market in the United States to go bust and the problem is, the global problem is that everybody wanted, everybody in the world essentially, wanted a piece of the American real estate market. And they got a piece of that American real estate market through these collateralized debt obligation, collateralized mortgage obligations, the securitization of uh, thousands, millions of mortgages and people buying shares, pieces of those mortgages. And then came this bust. Housing prices went down. Uh, too many houses. These collateralized mortgage obligations became worthless. And that, that illness spread very quickly throughout the global economy. The developing world, for most countries, weren't very involved in um, getting a piece of these collateralized mortgage obligations. Uh, most countries in the developing world were possibly not thriving, but, but doing pretty well, uh, except for sectors of sub-Saharan Africa and parts of uh, the Middle East. But overall, the developing world was doing pretty well over the past 10 or 15 years. There was an abundance of credit. The construction cranes, regardless of where you went, whether it was Eastern Europe, whether it was South America, whether it was in parts of Africa, you saw these construction cranes all over, meaning that there was cheap money available and everybody was taking advantage of it. But now, this bubble has burst, and you could hear it burst. You could hear it 10 billion different little bursts in 2008. It's amazing that people didn't wake up in the morning hearing these, this cacophony of, of bubbles bursting. <laughs> Equity markets have tanked, meaning that people have sold off stocks and bonds in order to bring that money back to uh, fill these burst bubbles back in the United States and the Western financial markets. Foreign banks have stopped lending to the developing world. Uh, we expect that there'll be a decrease in overall global trade by 25% this year, which bodes ill for both the developed world and the developing world. There's some countries that are a bit immune. Uh, the Chinese have been uh, exporting uh, very successfully, as you probably know, for uh, many years, for 15 years at least, ever since the opening up of China by uh, Deng Xiaoping in 1978. But over the past 15 years, the Chinese economy has, has flourished through export-led, um, uh, the export-led market. So China, just a few months ago, announced that it was going to infuse 600 billion American dollars into their country. They had the capital to do it. They didn't have to borrow any money like we're having to do. They simply had it available. They had foreign exchange. They have foreign exchange available because of their very successful uh, export concentration. The Russians also have a great deal of money and are investing or pumping 220 billion American dollars into the, their financial system. They have it because of high oil, high oil prices. Uh, the Koreans also have some money because they were successful in uh, export-led manufacturing. Some other countries that um, are getting infusions of capital, Hungary, some of the Eastern European countries, Ukraine from uh, the European Central Bank and from the International Monetary Fund, they don't have the wherewithal like the Chinese and the Russians do. So they're borrowing from multilateral lenders, the IMF, the European Central Bank. All of this financial turmoil is causing a lot of political strife. Those of you who have been reading the news know that people have been on strike in um, Latvia and Lithuania, what are called the, uh, the Baltic states. Uh, there's been riots in Greece. There's strikes in France because of uh, people being laid off. Spain now has currently 13% unemployment. It's projected to go to 20% unemployment. We're worried because our unemployment is at 7%. The Spanish level of unemployment is three times, will be three times this year, what ours is. And so 
people are demonstrating their, their displeasure. And that has some ramifications for the, the spread of uh, market capitalism and democracy, which usually goes along with market <coughs> capitalism. Now, the question is, um, what's going to happen to the world of globalized finance? Are we going to pull back into a shell uh, and attempt to protect jobs in the United States, which is exactly what we did 70, 80 years ago, 1930, 1931, with the Smoot-Hawley tariff. Uh, this is something that Congress passed. It, it built up trade barriers, and essentially every country in the world, every developed country back then, did the same thing. They protected their own domestic industries, which caused the depression, or uh, what was a recession back in 1929 and 1930, to become a depression. That's what we want to avoid. We don't want to pull back into um, a trade shell, protect our own industries, uh, because then, in fact, we will suffer a global depression. What's happening is, uh, because banks are attempting to fill these bubbles that have burst, there's less foreign bank lending. Um, because of this need to fill these, these voids back in their home countries, banks have uh, pulled back from bond markets and stock markets, equity markets. Tighter credit means slower growth. So one could expect that growth in the developing world is going to be a fraction of what it has been. And when we think of the developing world, you know, I don't know what you think about. Um, typically, we think about sub-Saharan Africa or the people in South Asia and in India or, pa uh, or Bangladesh or Pakistan. But, and the poverty that still exists there. But most of the developing world is doing pretty well. It's growing faster than the United States. We consider good growth in gross domestic product at about 3% a year. Well, bad growth in China uh, is 7%. That's what the Chinese expect this year, down from between 10 and 13%, which was their average growth over the past 10 years. So the developing world is, in fact, growing. And so what's happening now is the specter of slower growth. And when we have slower growth, that means that people will remain in poverty for longer than um, they would if, in fact, that country was growing faster, the country's economy was growing faster. Now, some countries are almost immune from what's, what's going on. The Chinese, the Russians, the, the Emirates, um, the people that have uh, been doing very well on, on $150 barrel of oil, they have what are called current account surpluses, meaning they export more than they import, and when they export, they're bringing dollars and euros and yen and Swiss francs into their uh, domestic accounts, so they're doing very well. There are a lot of countries that have negative uh, current account balances, meaning they import more than they export, and they have to pay for those imports, and those countries typically also have budget deficits. They're spending more than they're taking in in taxes. Those countries don't have the wherewithal to provide these infusions of cash. And also, they cannot borrow on the world financial market like the United States can. Everybody wants a piece of the United States, continues to want a piece of the United States. And we're very willing to sell them a piece in the form of treasury bonds. That's the way we borrow money. That's the way the Obama administration is going to raise 800 and whatever it is, between 800 and a trillion dollars. I've heard lots of numbers in between 800 billion and 1 trillion. That's the way we're going to finance um, infrastructure spending and building new hospitals and uh, repairing bridges and, and all the things that we need to do in order to get us out of the situation that we're in. But there are a lot of poor countries that simply can't do that. Nobody wants to buy their debt. Everybody wants to buy our debt because we're not going to go out of business anytime soon. But, you know, a country like uh, Romania might actually declare a sovereign bankruptcy. It's a, happened in the past and not the distant past. The Argentines declared a sovereign bankruptcy in 2002. $160 billion worth of debt said, sorry, we can't pay it. The Russians did the same thing in 1997. Sorry, we can't pay it. The United States is not going to do that. So our debt is very attractive, which is a good thing, because if it wasn't, um, then we would be headed for a situation that's a great deal more dire than the situation that we're in right now. The example of China. China is kind of unique because the banks in China are state-run. 
the great majority of them are state run. The biggest ones um, are state run and therefore are pretty much, have been pretty much insulated from what's been going on in overall financial markets. They have $2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. That's not uh, US government debt. This is cash that they have available. And so it's very easy for the Chinese government to begin spending, uh, a fiscal policy in other words, begin spending and helping to build roads and bridges and uh, just infuse money into the economy in order to make sure that overall growth doesn't slip below 7.5% because most Chinese economists believe that if in fact growth falls below 7.5% then there's going to be a lot of social problems. People will demonstrate, demonstrate against the government. So it's, it behooves the Chinese government to spend, spend as much as it can afford in order to make sure that economy continues to grow. The BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China's the sea. Uh, these countries are also doing okay. Brazil is a very diversified economy. It's got agriculture, it's got manufacturing, it's got um, uh, a large service sector, it has uh, technology, it's doing very well. As a matter of fact, it's probably the, the most, the healthiest uh, economy in, in South America or Latin America and probably one of the healthiest economies in the Southern Hemisphere. So they're doing fine. Russia, as I mentioned, is doing fine because of its uh, income from, from petroleum. India also uh, is doing reasonably well, although they're not quite as strong as the Russians or the Chinese. The smaller countries are the ones that are going to be affected by what's going on in the overall uh, uh, global economy. And they're the ones that need the most assistance. And the assistance that they will get is from multilateral agencies like the World Bank and the International uh, Monetary Fund. And also by lenders like China and Russia who have a great deal of capital to lend. The Chinese have been all over the world attempting to cultivate friendships with, develop with countries in the developing world. The Russians have just lent Iceland, who is, has been in the, which has been in the news um, over the past couple of months because its economy is totally wrecked because of its involvement, it, its bank's involvement in, in these um, toxic debt uh, instruments. The Russians loaned the Ice, uh, Icelandic government five billion dollars, five billion American dollars. So the countries that have this capital will be out there attempting to cultivate, cultivate friendships. Now, um, region by region. As I mentioned, Africa's financial system hasn't been very well integrated in the global financial market. So very little exposure to, um, especially the subprime market. Uh, African banks uh, typically uh, don't get involved, did not get involved in, in the, this toxic debt situation. Economies in Africa typically um, they do well or they uh, do poorly independent of what's going on in their financial markets. Financial markets in Africa are not very well developed. Africa gets its capital in order to conduct business two ways. One is through aid. The second is through um, what's called foreign direct investment. Companies coming into Africa and um, exploring for oil, digging oil wells, or opening copper mines, or uranium mines. That's the way Africa grows, through the exploitation of its natural resources, its minerals. The countries that have a great deal of petroleum deposits in Africa are hurting now that petroleum prices have gone down. Um, Nigeria depends on oil. Its budget is geared to oil being $63 a barrel. The Russians also um, are geared toward $70 oil. So um, as long as oil stays below $70 or $60, uh, many of these countries that have built up a great many reserves um, can, can continue to be reasonably buoyant until their reserves kind of run out. And um, nobody's projecting the price of oil to be any more than $40 or $50 for the next two years. So. Probably by 2011, if prices of oil don't um, um, rebound, then the Russians are going to be in a kind of dire straits. And also these other countries in, in Africa uh, will be hurting. Again, here's just a, a review of um, many of these countries depend on their natural resources. Copper 
and um, zinc and nickel in, in Zambia and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Rather than growing at 5%, which has been the average growth in the continent of Africa, all the countries taken together from 1998 to 2008, over the past 10 years, growth probably is going to drop to 3%. Of course, that depends on how far these basic commodity prices drop. If, in fact, we go into a global depression, then prices are going to drop much more than they have dropped, and these countries will be affected much, much greater. Uh, the effect on them will be much greater. Now, one last, one last thing about Africa. Um, the continent of Africa, made up of 54 countries, I think, has benefited a great deal by uh, what's called the Washington Consensus. And there are a lot of people who talk about the Washington Consensus and say how harsh it's been on countries that have attempted to borrow from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The Washington Consensus is the World Bank and the IMF and programs called structural adjustment and conditionality, meaning, yes, we'll give you a billion dollars, but you have to do this and this and this in order to, uh, for us to provide you with that capital. And this and this and this typically um, involved uh, lowering budget deficits, that is, the government needed to decrease spending or increase taxes. And the way governments in the developing world typically did that was to fire a lot of public empo employees. In the developing world, in the United States, we uh, the government of the United States employs two or three million people out of a population of the federal government, out of a population of 305 million people. That's kind of a small fraction. But there are countries in the world where the federal government employs 70 or 80 percent or sometimes 90 percent or sometimes 95 percent of all the people in formal employment and that's very expensive and so the world bank the imf beginning probably 30 years ago dictated the conditions that these countries uh, needed to meet in order to be qualified for loans low budget deficits low inflation that is decrease in government spending low interest rates, and it's worked. Good economic management has actually worked in Africa. There are success stories in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. Botswana, um, who has an American educated president, is probably the biggest success story of all of sub-Saharan Africa. Its economy has been doing very well for a long time. Of course, it has a great deal of minerals to sell, but more than that, it has uh, very low levels of corruption, and most of these countries in the, in the second point here have low levels of corruption. Um, a civil war uh, stopped in Mozambique about 10 or 12 years ago. That's always good. That helps development if the war actually stops. Ghana just had an election a few weeks ago, and there was a transition of government that went very smoothly, which is big news in Africa. It's not big news in the United States. We expect the old president to graciously bow out and the new president take over. That doesn't happen in Africa. Many times people take to the streets or people go to the barricades or rebel armies form, depending on what faction uh, you're supporting. So there have been success stories. And the reason why there have been these success stories in these particular countries is because of the Washington Consensus. So, it's pretty obvious that Africa can be affected by what's going on in the global economy if commodity prices bottom out and stay low for a couple of years, which they might do, depending on, again, other parts of uh, the global economy. If international lending institutions decide to uh, pull back, then, especially when you're talking about countries that have uh, high political risk, high economic risk associated with them. But not a lot of lending is going to be going into the Democratic Republic of Congo because they've been fighting uh, essentially since 1960 for, um, uh, for 50 years. One faction versus the other faction. And you know, the country is as big as Western Europe. So how do you, and with no roads. So it's very difficult to uh, have any confidence that that country is going to evolve into something that is, will be a beacon for uh, all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Latin America, again, this is a region of the world that hasn't been uh, very well, very much involved in um, global financial markets. Uh, they depend, most of Latin, Central America and South America depend on uh, 
exports, typically of um, basic commodities, minerals, uh, depending on what country you're talking about, oil, uh, and also agricultural commodities. And so their, their uh, exposure to what's going on is not as great. Um, again, if commodity prices uh, decrease, then we'd expect that Latin America would be affected considerably. Also, a lot of people from Latin America immigrate, um, many to um, the United States, and send back money to their home countries. In some countries, that makes up between 10 and 15 percent of their gross domestic product, remittances, the money that people send back to their families. Um, and obviously, if those folks can't find jobs or if they're laid, out, laid off of work in the United States, um, those remittances are going to decrease and that's going to uh, affect, negatively affect these economies. But there are some economies in Latin America that are stronger. A couple of them are uh, Mexico and Chile. Uh, Chile has infused $500 million into its uh, state bank. Uh, it has the wherewithal to do that. Chile is one of the um, stronger economies in South America after Brazil. And Mexico, because of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, has become much stronger in the 15 years that NAFTA has been in place. And some people were a little bit wor worried when President Obama during the campaign said he was going to reevaluate, reassess NAFTA. Uh, and many of us are hoping that he's going to forget about that campaign promise because NAFTA has been uh, very beneficial to the country that was targeted when NAFTA was created. The country that was targeted, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, wasn't developed to enhance the American economy. It wasn't developed to enhance the Canadian economy. It was developed to enhance Mexico. And since 1995, 1994, 95, when that treaty came into effect, the economy of Mexico has grown by about 8% a year, which is good. It creates jobs for Mexicans in Mexico. And we want to enhance that. We want that economy to become even stronger. The economy is strong enough so that it's been able to increase public spending and focus money on infrastructure. It's been able to provide loans to small businesses, businesses that were at risk. And so Mexico has gotten stronger because of this treaty that we engaged, um, we developed with the Mexicans and the Canadians. So I'm hoping that. Um, what Mr. Obama said was just campaign rhetoric, and they don't do anything about NAFTA. Now, the big hit as far as equity markets go has been East Asia. And when I say East Asia, what I mean is, well, the Chinese stock market has gone down considerably, 60%. But also, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, th those are the East Asian, what we're called tigers their stock markets pretty much have collapsed um, because in, uh, institutional investors have sold off those equities and moved their money, again, to fill in the holes that these bubbles bursting in, in Western economies um, have created. The problem with East Asia is that all these countries, essentially all of these countries, depend on exports. And when countries like the United States stop buying, and we have. Uh, consumption in the United States um, has essentially f uh, flattened out. It's, we, uh, we're a consumption economy, and now we're not buying anything, which hurts us in the United States, but it hurts these folks in East Asia even more, because they depend on the US for their export market. But notice that the overall growth in East Asia is expected to slow to 7.5%. Um, again, in the United States, good growth is 3%. Of course, these countries are starting from a much lower base, but still, 7.5%. Most, a lot of these countries over the past 10 years have been growing at double digits. So bringing the overall growth rate down to 7.5% will have a significant impact. The Chinese are very frightened that 7% growth is not going to provide for uh, the things in the, uh, that people in the rural areas are seeing on their television sets and decide that they want. So another reason why the Chinese are engaging in um, $600 billion of spending. East Asian economies haven't found an alternative to export-led growth, export-driven growth. 
And until they do, they're going to be dependent on what's occurring in, in Western Europe and the United States, North American market, Canada and the United States. So their fortunes, as this says, are tied directly to the domestic health, the health of the domestic economies in the West. What they need to do is kind of concentrate on, um, on developing their own markets. Uh, and the Japanese have tried to do that. The Chinese are trying to do that. But the difference between Asian people and um, Western people is that Asians save. They're huge savers, typically 30% of their income. That's the average savings rate in Japan, 30% of their income. In the United States, we're spenders. Um, average credit card debt in the U.S. is about $6,000 a card. So we have negative savings in many years. So somewhere in the middle, too much saving is no good because the domestic market hasn't developed sufficiently, but too little saving is also not great. So someplace in the middle, between 30% and like a negative 2 or 3%, not quite sure exactly where that is, but somewhere in the middle is the ideal amount of saving and the ideal amount of spending. South Asia. And what I'd like to talk about here is something called microfinance. And some of you might be aware of what microfinance is. This is lending small amounts of money to either one individual or a group of individuals, and typically women. Started by, the concept was started uh, about 25 years ago by a fellow named Mohammed Yunus, uh, someone from Bangladesh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe last year, 2007, I think, 2007. Uh, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for this, for the, uh, the creation of the notion that poor people are credit worthy. You could lend money to poor people and they would be, you could, they're trustworthy. They, would pay, they will pay back this money. If a poor person in, in, well, anywhere, comes into a bank, probably the banker is not going to be all that excited about talking to them. And in many developing countries, they probably wouldn't be even allowed in the door. But here's a fellow who started uh, a bank called the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and encouraged poor women to borrow money in order to become entrepreneurs, in order to start a business or to finance an ongoing business. If, in fact, credit availability is hurt, and that's the way the institutions that engage in microfinance in South Asia. When I say South Asia, I'm talking about India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sri Lanka. If those institutions that are involved in microfinance can't find credit, then um, interest rates that they have to charge to their uh, borrowers are going to go up. And that kind of defeats the entire purpose. What you want is low interest rates so these individuals don't have any problems paying back their loans. Some of the statistics from uh, the Grameen Bank and the other banks that are involved in microfinance are really astounding. Uh, the payback rates are much higher than uh, individuals or companies that have um, long history of, of, of borrowing money. So it's good business to lend money to poor people. And more and more banks in this region, bigger banks, uh, now have a microfinance uh, division in order to take advantage of this, this concept, this totally new concept that uh, Mohammed Yudis came up with. So these small unsecured loans, unsecured mean there's no, means that there's no collateral involved because these individuals simply don't have something to put up uh, in order for the bank to uh, be assured that something will be there if uh, they don't pay back this loan. Um, these unsecured loans are under threat, uh, and they're much more liable to go away than any other kind of credit. So that's, that's a big issue um, and a big threat in this particular part of the world. There are literally millions and millions of uh, individuals that have borrowed money uh, through microfinance and have been very successful using that money to develop little industries. Little companies, not little industries, but maybe little industries. Now, the effect on women, this, uh, we're getting close to uh, uh, the end. Microfinance is focused on women uh, because the original lender, Mr. Yunus, an economist, by the way, 
a PhD from, I'm not quite sure, I think some American uh, university. Focused on women because he thought that they were uh, more responsible than men. And, you know, it's been my experience in my travels, in my living uh, overseas, uh, that's the case. If you're going to borrow and lend money to somebody, you want it to be a female rather than the male of the species. It's women that have driven developing world growth. These are the people that work the hardest, that make sure that their families have food, that uh, the children on their back when they're out there uh, tending their gardens are fed first. Um, they're the ones that are looking for a little bit of capital in order to uh, start a business or grow a business that they're involved in. The textile industry, which is worldwide, you know, just check, check out the labels on uh, the stuff that you're wearing right now, and we get, we buy stuff from all over the world, as you know. Uh, all those pieces of clothes, for the most part, are put together by women. Women in the textile industry um, support, as this says, seven family members. If there are fewer jobs available because of what's going on in the global credit markets, then fewer remittances will be paid back to female um, members of the family of the female who's immigrated in order to work in a textile factory. If you travel around the developing world, you see many, many factories established in places where labor is very cheap. And the people that staff those factories are typically immigrants, people that have immigrated from Japan, the Philippines, not Japan, China, the Philippines, other poor countries in order to take advantage of those jobs. So if those jobs go away, fewer remittances going back to uh, their country of origin, and those countries will become poorer. As the United States and other Western countries focus their capital on bailing out their own financial industries, there's going to be less international assistance. The United States only spends 0.16% of its gross domestic product on international aid. We're way, way down on the list. Um, the highest country on the list is, I believe, the Netherlands. Norway is way, way up there. They spend 2 or 3% of their GDP on assistance to developing countries. Ours is just a tiny, tiny fraction of our gross domestic product. Again, we're about to spend a trillion dollars that we're about to borrow on our own economy, which means that probably we're not going to be focused on what's going on in the developing world much. Mr. Obama has too much to be concerned about in his own economy, to be concerned about what's going on in, in, um, in Niger or Chad or Burkina Faso. And also there's going to be less investment in technology and especially agriculture because agriculture drives these economies, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Asia, and less investment, less technological innovation means less productivity, less output, poor countries. So that's, that's a risk. Women in Sub-Saharan Africa, 80% of the basic foodstuffs, their families, um, consume and also whatever is surplus they sell at the market. Again, women have been the driving force behind the developing world's uh, growth and when we're attempting to uh, portion out assistant fu assistance funds, it's very important that we focus on women and not just in microfinance but on human capital also, education. More education means um, women having less children, fewer children, and the children that they do have are healthier, and populations are controlled a little bit better, and that makes everybody in the population better off. Finally, the effect on democracy. Usually when we think about capitalism, we also think about democracy, and people in the developing world think the same way. They look at us, the United States or Great Britain, or Western Europe as an example. And they see capitalism working. And they see the political system that's associated with capitalism. That's typically democracy. And they think, you know, if we don't have democracy, probably maybe democracy is step one and then we have prosperity. Well, that's kind of threatened right now. Um, people are looking at the United States. People are pointing to the United States saying that it's our system of capitalism that has caused what's going on in financial markets and what eventually will become a global recession, not to say a depression, hopefully not. 
So people are wondering whether, in fact, democracy is the right way to go, wondering whether capitalism, in fact, is the right way to go. So the entire credibility of free market capitalism at sta is at stake here, which is kind of where I started off. We see that we're one step away from nationalizing the banking system in the United States. One step away. I mean, how much money does Bank of America or Citigroup need in order to become financially stable? I mean, they're essentially black holes. All we've done is pour billion, hundreds of billions of dollars into these companies, and they're still losing a tremendous amount of money. The next step is to nationalize the banking system in the U.S., and once we do that, we're kind of on the road to socialism. I mean, that is a major step towards socializing um, uh, an economy. The United Kingdom is doing the same thing. So what's happening, what will happen probably, is that the private sector is becoming more constrained and government is going to play a much bigger role. Uh, Mr. Obama has already said that. Government is going to play a much bigger role in a very good way. We're going to be spending, we're not going to throw our weight around too much, one hopes. Um, but the point here is that we have a broken financial system and we're trying to fix it using every tool that we possibly can. Monetary policy last year, that didn't work. Interest rates are at zero and we're still in a, uh, a grievous situation. So now we're trying the other tool that we have, fiscal policy, and hopefully that'll work because if that doesn't work, then as I told my class last night, we're up a creek. Uh, we don't have any tools left. What we're gonna have to do if fiscal policy doesn't work is the business cycle will eventually take us out of where we are. Uh, eventually, businesses will start buying capital equipment, people will go back to work, but that could be like five or six years away. You know, John Maynard Keynes, the most famous economist in the 20th century, said that um, in the long run, probably capitalist economies will move toward equilibrium and everybody will prosper. But we live in the short run. In the long run, he said, we're all dead. So we need to do something in the short run which was the motivation for Franklin Roosevelt to begin his, his program of government spending. So what we don't want to happen is that Western values, Western style capitalism is discredited by, discredited by what's going on in, in, in financial markets. So there are a lot of non-consolidated democracies in the world. I think the previous slide said that 50% of the people in the world live under some kind of a democracy, some kind. Uh, the emphasis is on some kind of a democracy. Not a democracy that, that uh, we're accustomed to, but budding democracies. And those are the countries that are at risk in this kind of a situation. Um, and those countries are in Latin America and Eastern Europe. We look at Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. We look at the, the fellow in in Bolivia, uh, Bolivia uh, what is his name, Morales? And we see a bit of totalitarianism taking over. We don't want that to happen. And we have to do everything we can in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. If it does happen, probably what's gonna happen overall throughout the world is something that we could call authoritarian capitalism, which is what the Chinese have right now. This is a picture of Deng Xiaoping who was the premier in 1978 when China opened its economy to the global economy. It was Nixon back in 1972-1973 that originally visited Mao Zedong and, and kind of opened up China to the world, but it was this guy a few years later that decided that the way the Chinese were practicing communism wasn't making um, the hundreds of millions of people prosperous. And so he decided to adopt uh, capitalism with a Chinese face. What we'd like to avoid is the adoption of authoritarian capitalism because there are a lot of bad things associated with the way the Chinese do business. There are a lot of good things, uh, a very swift movement out of poverty of hundreds of millions of people, a very quick way to infuse capital into the economy. You don't have to go through Congress, you don't have to cuddle up to the Republicans and say, you know, this is a good thing and yes, we'll cut this and no, we won't cut that. The Chinese government says $600 billion, bang, and it, it's, it's out there. So this is kind of what we want to, um, I believe, avoid. You know, time will tell whether authoritarian capitalism is the best way or market capitalism is the best way. That's it. Thank you.
Yeah. Well, we appreciate that. So that was that was really a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, our respondent going to be is uh, Brian G. Smith, Dr. Smith, assistant professor of political science here. Came here two years ago almost. Received his BA in political science from Oberlin College in uh, Ohio, the uh, abolitionist school that was <laughs> radical. <laughs> and MA and PhD degrees in political science from Brown University. And before coming here, he, he taught at Colgate University and Middle Georgia College. And um, he teaches a lot of different courses, as many of you know, comparative politics, international politics, public policy in weak states, political institutions in transition, democratic theory, introductory European politics, political institutions, public policy, and civil society. Um, he has many different research interests in, in uh, those and many other areas. He served as a research assistant at uh, the Carter Center and received fellowships and grants from Brown University and Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And this past summer, he was a Fulbright Scholar a Fulbright Scholar in, in Hungary. And um, we're, we're glad he's here and he's going to give a response. Thank you, Dr. Isaacs. Uh, good evening. Um, a lot of familiar faces uh, out there. Uh, I'm going to be uh, reasonably brief. Uh, I actually, as a respondent, uh, had decided not to uh, directly comment on any of the details. I knew I wouldn't be able to improve on uh, Dr. Smedra's uh, uh, very good presentation and the details that he provided concerning the world uh, financial crisis. I intended uh, to only make uh, one or two uh, brief textual uh, remarks, but I'm a political scientist and I just can't help myself. Uh, and so I need to uh, respond directly to just a few points, actually just add to a couple points and respond. Uh, first of all, uh, he mentioned uh, the uh, purpose of NAFTA. Uh, and I just about jumped out of my chair when he just sort of cut off uh, at the point, leaving it that uh, uh, it was all for the benefit of Mexico. Uh, which, uh, but I think we would uh, both agree, I think uh, Dr. Smedra would agree with me that uh, the long-term purpose, of course, is uh, United States interests. We want a large, uh, developed, uh, strong industrial economy as our major trading partner right to the south. It can only help our economy in the long run. Uh, so NAFTA uh, has our own, you know, is in our own interests. Um, second thing is we probably could probably uh, argue all night about uh, the Washington consensus uh, and whether or not that's actually been a good thing uh, overall for uh, the developing world. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement over that so-called Washington consensus uh, that was mentioned and its uh, uh, negative impact on the people that actually live in the developing societies uh, uh, in these developing countries. Uh, you can balance a little slightly better GDP, uh, excuse me, GDP growth uh, due to better budget deficits or something like that uh, against actual uh, harm of being uh, imposed on the poorest of the poor in a lot of those countries. Uh, and the third thing is actually kind of positive. Uh, the last, my last little point is actually kind of positive, uh, and that has to do with democratization, uh, a particular uh, uh, specialty of mine. But uh, in that financial crises actually can help democracy quite frequently. Uh, an economic crisis or a financial crisis of any kind uh, can undermine the legitimacy of any kind of shaky government, authoritarian or democratic. Uh, so certainly where there are shaky democracies in the world, uh, you could see a financial crisis undermine that democracy in some way. But a shaky authoritarian system is just as likely to be undermined by a financial crisis. If you look in the 1980s, uh, throughout the uh, 
Latin, uh, throughout Latin America, South America, Central America. There was a uh, major economic financial crisis in the 1980s, and that actually led to greater democratization. You saw uh, democratization sweep through Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Latin, uh, Central America, various kinds. Uh, and the financial crisis actually is credited with increasing the number of democracies in the world. Um, so it's not all gloom and doom necessarily uh, in terms of financial crisis and democracy. But I did not intend to make any specific uh, responses. Uh, so uh, I have one uh, major point simply to make, um, and that is to try to place this financial crisis uh, into historical and systemic context for you. The financial crisis is not an act of nature. It's not a natural disaster. It's not some kind of unavoidable product of markets. Certainly market failures is a good way of describing uh, what is going on currently, but there is no inherent property to how our economy works, or for that matter the global economy works, that necessitates this kind of crisis from just coming along like a storm we have to weather. Everything about our economy and our finances is a product of human actions and decisions, a product of the society we want to create, and the rules by which we actually govern that society. The global financial system is exactly such an institution. It's exactly the pro uh, uh, no more nor no less than the product of human action, human behavior, and the rules by which we want to govern ourselves, either in a country or internationally across the entire world. Our current system is only 38 years old. It's not like this has been the way the world works for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's 38 years old. And so I want to place uh, that system, this current system, in its historical context for you. Uh, first of all, uh, prior to World War II, we had a distinctly different global financial and economic system out there. Uh, the best way to describe it, I guess, is uh, you had a very long, enduring uh, mercantilist period of colonial empires clashing with one another over uh, creating trade blocks, protectionist trade blocks. This should sound familiar to you if you have a pa even a passing familiarity with world history. We had colonial empires dividing up the planet and creating trade relationships with uh, what is now the developing world that was very exploitative. Um, and focused around benefiting the uh, colonial empire uh, back home. This protectionism exacerbated various global economic crises that uh, happened at the beginning of the 20th century, leading right up to the 1930s depression uh, that Dr. Smedra mentioned. Uh, the protectionism uh, surrounding it uh, helped even feed World War II as these countries uh, clashed. And what we call uh, uh, the developing world today certainly was openly exploited by the system. At the end of World War II, we moved into a distinctly different style of financial system. Uh, the United States came out of World War II, as you know, the dominant power in the world, both economically and militarily. And in 1944, even before the end of uh, the war, we put together the fundamentals of a brand new financial system. We saw uh, not only the, poverty, the uh, economic hardships of the 1930s as needing to be fixed, but we also saw uh, the global con uh, military conflicts as needing to be fixed. And so in 1944, uh, you may have heard of this before, uh, in 1944 we set up what were called the Bretton Woods uh, agreements. It's uh, the very famous uh, uh, set of agreements that we entered into with, uh, particularly with Britain, but also uh, other uh, powers at the time. And we established a new, brand new financial system that was going to be to our economic benefit, certainly, because we would be the dominant player inside that system. But also, there was uh, definitely an idealism involved in the idea that we need to lower trade barriers, we need to free, uh, uh, stabilize the global economy for peaceful reasons, for uh, the need to encourage peace. Um, so. We entered into these agreements and uh, we created a set of institutions to govern the global economy. Uh, we created something called the IBRD, the uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, you may have heard, uh, it's actually called uh, the World Bank now. Uh, the IBRD got uh, folded into something called the World Bank, uh, which does sound familiar. Uh, its purpose was simply to reconstruct Europe. 
We wanted to rebuild Europe. Uh, and over time, over the decades to follow, after Europe was sort of rebuilt to a great extent, uh, the IBRD actually expanded outwards to helping the developing world as well. Uh, it became involved in uh, development in other parts of the world. Another piece of the Bretton Woods uh, uh, Accords uh, were uh, an attempt towards lowering protectionism, all those trade barriers that I just mentioned that were existed between the colonial empires. Uh, they actually didn't get the institution they wanted. They wanted something uh, that was going to be sort of uh, a very forceful institution that would uh, be able to almost force countries to lower their protectionist barriers. They didn't get that. But what they did get was the GATT, uh, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade. Uh, and over many decades, that actually developed into something more resembling what they had originally wanted, the World Trade Organization, which you may have heard of. And the entire goal of it was to reduce protectionism. But central to our point, my point today, um, is that we also created the IMF. Uh, Dr. Smedra mentioned in passing, um, it was central to this entire Bretton Woods Agreement. The IMF is known as the International Monetary Fund, and it was handed responsibility for governing and regulating the global financial system. We had had a sort of warring states global financial system prior to World War II. And what they decided to create after World War II was a highly regulated system. I'll come back to that in a second. The IMF had two basic roles. First, the IMF governed the, fifth, excuse me, the fixed exchange rate system for the world exchange rates of currencies between countries, different types of money, British pounds to American dollars, became fixed. There was no global market for currencies like there, was today, there is today, where you can just go out and speculate on the value of currency. You can just buy and sell currency, it'll go up, the prices of currency will go up and down. Instead, currencies were fixed against each other. They were allowed a little bit of wiggle room that the IMF had a great deal of control over but they were all fixed against the United States dollar. And the IMF governed this system. And the United States controlled the IMF uh, to a great extent. And therefore, the United States essentially governed the international financial system. The second thing the IMF was designed to do was to provide loans to countries. Uh, whenever a country was going to uh, potentially face some kind of currency crisis, the IMF was supposed to step in and provide a loan. Uh, you see, the idea is if, you've, uh, in incredible, if you're a country and you find yourself in an incredible amount of debt that you simply cannot pay off, well, then you could just run off so much money that your currency becomes worthless, and that means your debt is worthless. And, that's precise, and therefore, you're out of the debt, because if you owe a trillion dollars and a trillion dollars isn't worth anything, then you have essentially no debt. If a trillion dollars would buy you a candy bar, you really don't have to worry about your debt anymore. And the IMF was designed specifically to try to avoid countries having to uh, drop into that sort of trap, uh, which is very damaging to their economy and destabilizing to the global financial system. So the second thing the IMF was supposed to do was to provide loans to countries when they needed them, when they were, currency crisis, when they were faced with a potential currency crisis, helping them to pay their debts. These two functions, particularly the first, the major function of the IMF, created a relatively stable, relatively stable global financial system. But also at the same time, private capitalists and banks were very restrained in their behavior. There are rules and intense rules and guidelines that compared to today choked off a great deal of uh, private investment that could have been taking place around the world. But nevertheless, the system was stable. It was regulated. <coughs> well, the system changed in 1971 into the system that uh, we have today. Uh, the United States uh, at the time was under uh, increasing financial pressure. We, had, we were fighting uh, uh, the, in a very expensive war in Vietnam. Uh, we had mounting trade deficits uh, that were uh, causing us to have uh, serious currency problems. And uh, President Nixon decided that the uh, best response would be to uh, take us what is off of what was called the gold standard. But what that really meant was we would no longer allow the U.S. dollar to be the fixed uh, rate of exchange currency 
currency for the world. We took ourselves out of unilaterally this fixed exchange rate system. Uh, it was essentially uh, the elimination of the global financial system that had existed for, uh, I guess it's 26 years, uh, between 1945 and 1971. Uh, at the same time, very quickly, banking and investment rules followed uh, with the uh, elimination of uh, the system of ex exchange rights. They eliminated banking and investment rules uh, all around uh, the world. So it was essentially the entire sweeping away of the previous global financial system. Uh, we tried to counter it. We tried to deal with it a little bit. Uh, we tried to uh, keep... Uh, uh, governmental control over the system a little bit, uh, despite the fact that we essentially deregulated the planet. Um, in 1974, uh, finance ministers from the various uh, industrial countries, it started with six and uh, when Canada got added on in 1975, uh, it became known as the G7. Uh, if you've ever heard of the G7, it's the meet regular annual meeting of finance ministers to try to create government input into this global financial system. Don't confuse it, by the way. Uh, if you've heard of the G8, uh, that's something totally different. Uh, that's like this regular annual meeting of the leaders of, uh, well, the G7 plus Russia countries. Uh, but the G7 uh, just had to do with the finance ministers meeting to try to keep a little bit of government control over what had become a free-for-all, deregulated financial system to have some kind of impact on it. So. It is cur our current system has two major consequences for the developing world. The first major consequence for the developing world is that international capital, credit, and investment have become far more available to, the, to these countries. Capital investment is uh, private investment is very easy to shift around the planet at this point. There is no uh, uh, global institutional regulation controlling it. There's no governments involving themselves in the exchange rate between these, uh, the an investing country and a country receiving the investment. Um, so this has led to growth throughout the developing world since the 1970s as inv private investment and credit became uh, uh, far more easily available uh, all around the planet in this, and uh, uh, av certainly available to the developing world in a great uh, deal. This actually combined with the uh, 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 impact of what is called globalization uh, in that uh, transportation and information exchange became cheap quick uh, and eased the uh, speed at which uh, capital and investment and credit could shift around the entire world. The second major consequence of our current global financial system, of this totally deregulated system, um, is increased instability. We had given up in 1971 stability and sort of constrained capital investment in exchange for very freely flowing capital and investment, but highly, a highly unstable system. It is, uh, our current system is more prone to having a financial crisis of any kind, and financial crises tend to spread very rapidly from one particular country to other countries uh, around the world. Basically, as fast as investment and credit can be poured into, say, uh, Malaysia, it can just as easily be yanked right back out again. At the first sign of any kind of trouble or potential issues, you can have credit and investment suddenly just pulled in, uh, out of the country, fleeing the country for safer shores, uh, dropping Malay that country into crisis. Malaysia in my example. The current financial crisis uh, that we're experiencing is by no means the first. Uh, caused by the instability inherent to uh, this global system. Not to say that uh, uh, under the previous system there were no such thing as a financial crisis, uh, but certainly they tend to be more intense uh, and potentially, one could argue, more frequent under the deregulated system we have. Uh, you only have to look at the 1980s, uh, uh, the Latin American debt crisis that I just mentioned uh, uh, previously. Uh, next decade, the, the Asian financial crisis. Uh, it popped off in Thailand and quickly spread across the entire world. The, uh, the Russian crisis, uh, Dr. Smedger mentioned, was a direct consequence, back in 97, was a direct, or was it 98, 97, 98, and it spread to Russia very quickly from Thailand. It was a direct result of this uh, Thailand uh, crisis of the 1990s, and here we are in the next decade having the next major crisis, financial crisis. 
Um, actually, some of the currency reserves uh, that Dr. Smedra mentioned that uh, some of these countries have, uh, like China had built up a substantial uh, foreign exchange reserve, um, but a number of other countries uh, have built them up, uh, had built up uh, uh, significant currency reserves today uh, directly as a result of that Asian crisis. They, uh, they looked at the 1997 crisis and a bunch of governments took action uh, to protect themselves from what they knew would be yet another crisis coming down the road. And so they started stockpiling uh, as much foreign exchange reserves uh, as they possibly could. Um, well, many countries have also responded to the 1997 financial crisis by trying to re-regulate the international system locally. Governments uh, started uh, creating more uh, restrictions within regional trading blocks. There were various, uh, various regional trading blocks around the world um, uh, have attempted to sort of re-regulate at least a little bit, made the first steps towards re-regulating at least their regional systems. Uh, there was not really much of a push in the 1990s towards any kind of global re-regulation or anything like that, uh, but certainly a number of countries, uh, governments, are seeing a need to try to put in place uh, some kind of control over the global financial system, at least locally. Um, well, uh, with yet another major crisis, today's crisis, uh, compounding on top of these previous ones, you have more and more governments in the world talking about re-regulating the system, about once again changing the basic nature of our global financial system. Like I said before, it's a human constructed thing. This is a socially constructed system, so the governments as expressions of society are interested in changing what the nature of that system is. You're starting to hear at least increased talk uh, about this amongst governments. For just for example, late last year, the European Union uh, called for this, uh, the European Union, uh, is that uh, an economy uh, arguably larger than the United States uh, uh, at, at this uh, point in certain ways. Um, and the European Union called for a complete overhaul of the global financial system. They, they said there was, quote, a need for genuine and complete reform of the global financial system. Uh, individual leaders have spoken out. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Gordon Brown of uh, Britain uh, called for new institutions of global governance and regulation to supervise the global financial institutions. In other words, he wanted to revisit the previous system we had. The one we had 38 years ago, that Bretton Woods system that was highly, reg uh, highly regulated system. And he had actually called, uh, he called for not only strengthening uh, the remaining institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, beefing them up so that they actually are meaningful in a strong way to the global financial system now, uh, but also creating new institutions uh, to regulate uh, global finance. Well, there are two problems and I, that I want to uh, end on here. I'm, I know we're running short on time. Uh, there are two problems potentially for achieving any of the uh, collective action uh, necessary to uh, actually change the global financial system uh, uh, again uh, in the ways that we saw after World War II. The first is that the Bretton Woods system uh, was created after the devastation of the Second World War. Countries were almost universally eager, almost tripping over themselves, to ensure stability. They were desperate to uh, uh, get the economic growth to build them, uh, to rebuild their industry, to rebuild their economies, and they were willing to take uh, the United States' lead on, uh, on this and perfectly happy signing over uh, to regu uh, regulatory systems, uh, fixed exchange rates, et cetera. And this time, we don't have the devastation of the Second World War. Uh, the second potential problem for achieving any kind of collective action, whether it's a good idea or not, there are problems, is that the United States is no longer the completely dominant economic power of the world, uh, able to simply control and design the system. Uh, the first Bretton Woods agreements, this, in, uh, this global uh, set of financial institutional controls, was the creation, in a lot of ways, of the United States. It was able to use its economic position to design and control a system that would benefit itself and also benefit the world by lowering uh, trade barriers, et cetera, and providing stability. And now we don't have that. We don't have a dominant player. 
And if you study collective action theory, if you study uh, how uh, you know, groups behave, you'll discover that if there, is, there, if there isn't one boss in charge, it's harder to come to a decision and an agreement about the nature of things and what the agreement will be than if you have a bunch of different players involved, if you have a bunch of different people arguing and fighting over the nature of the system. Any new system that we create now, any kind of changes or reforms to the global financial system uh, would have to take into account the interests of rival economic powers. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, the European Union leaps uh, immediately to mind, but also, uh, almost inevitably, we would have to take into account the government of China's opinion, we'd have to take into account India's opi opinion at least, uh, no doubt Brazil and other uh, uh, major uh, economic powers would have to be taken into account and you would, it would be just simply much harder to reach any kind of collective agreement to uh, uh, concerning what form any kind of new financial system would take. Well, under our current, finally, just as my last comments, um, under our current system that the developing world has had the advantage of freely flowing investment and credit that's helped economic growth throughout the developing world. However, it will also continue to suffer under our current financial system due to the instability of it, the lack of regulation causing these financial crises. And the long-term impact, however, of this current financial crisis, I think Dr. Smedra did a fantastic job of summing up the, the, the short-term impact, but in terms of the long-term impact of this financial crisis, is I would say that with yet another crisis coming along like this, that there will be motivation amongst governments to create some kind of new global regulatory system. Rules of the game for commercial banks. Conditions concerning the free exchange of currencies. Conditions concerning investment. Regardless of what form this particular set of institutions takes. I hate, as a political scientist, I hate making predictions. Uh, we try to avoid them whenever possible. They tend to be wrong. Um, but if I was forced to make a prediction, I would predict that the developing world will not have all that much of a say in what these, the type of form the institutions actually uh, uh, take shape in. Uh, even if we do get reforms, if we do get a new set of financial institutions governing the global financial system, it is seriously unlikely that outside of China and India that much of the developing world will have a say in it, about what its shape it will take, uh, what kind of reforms should be made. Uh, they probably will not, they, at most they may be given a seat at the table, uh, but it probably won't be a dominant one, uh, and inevitably the global financial system uh, that comes out of such reforms might not actually help. Uh, uh, the uh, developing world any more uh, than the current uh, uh, system of essentially deregulation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there has to be some questions. We have some time for questions. It's a lot of information. Yes, Don? I have a question back, back to NASA, which I think is a good How would you defend or at least explain NAFTA to all the working class Americans who in the last 12 or 15 years have lost their manufacturing jobs, especially in textiles? How would you very simply explain or defend NAFTA to those people? I think the perception is that there's a connection between and the loss of all the I'll start. I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. I'll start. Uh, how would I defend it? Um, I would say you may lose your job, but you much have a you have a much better chance that your kids or your grandkids will have a job. And that's how I defend it. The, the way an, an economist would uh, defend it is that um, we use the argument that David Ricardo used comparative advantage that we probably didn't have a comparative advantage in the manufacture of, of clothing or television sets or all the other things that moved off to Mexico um, after NAFTA was established. And again, the theory and what Brian is, is saying is it's going to take some time for these, these kinds of effects to sort out. But in the long run, we, will, we in the United States will be better off because of this treaty and people in Mexico will be better off. So it may not be 
the people affected with their grandchildren. It's going to take a bit of time. Okay, there's going to be another question at least. Oh. Nothing? Well, oh, yes, sir. Socialism is not the winner, and communism is not the winner. I mean, we've all we've we've uh, experienced that, and we've moved on. The entire world has moved on. Uh, what's happening now, as I mentioned, like at the beginning of my little talk, is the capitalism has experienced a market failure, and we're about to address that market failure through more government intervention. We don't need to go back and revisit the good aspects of communism and the good aspects of socialism. I think we probably it would be a stretch to actually think about those and think about the good things that people in communist countries experienced uh, between 1917 and you know 1991. I, I don't mean that it's good, but coming back to China and what you said, it, it's a danger, that's what I mean. People may start thinking like, yeah, look at China, China is doing okay. But it's a, cap it's a capitalist country. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not communism, it's uh, author authoritarian capitalism, which, you know, is different than the way a uh, socialist system was, was structured. One second. Is that? Yes, sir. I have a question. Do you see that uh, the, um, China, Russia, and other countries, depending on export and economy, has been able to make organized savings based on the United States economy? So how can you do that both countries can save based on your economy and you cannot save through bread economy by exploiting them as well? Massive trade deficits. Okay. Um, we have what I think our current uh, trade deficit is running at something along the order of $800 billion a year. Um, it's been floating between 500 billion and 750 for like the past decade and a half uh, in that area. Uh, and obviously a lot of the money ends up getting reinvested in us in the form of buying up debt to us um, and another and a, you know, a wide number of other ways. Uh, but you can think of it as an outflowing of potential savings that uh, our government and our country could be doing. We've become a, uh, definitely a consumption-based society where uh, we're consuming what other countries are making, uh, rather than right, you know, at least for the past decade and a half in particular, uh, rather than consuming what we are making ourselves. And that leads to a lack of savings, especially in terms of uh, uh, our uh, current account deficit. Yes, Bill? I wonder if you could expand, uh, just to touch on the comment on the defense of NAFTA and uh, you know, that we have to suffer in order for our children and our grandchildren to have jobs. Because, I mean, that's a stretch. That's a 30 year, 50 year stretch. Could you just explain that a little bit? Well, um, again, uh, one has to go back to um, the classical economic theory and uh, David Ricardo who came up with this notion, actually it was, was Adam Smith, who came up with the notion of specialization, that you do what you do best and then trade for everything else, which David Ricardo kind of expanded to this notion of comparative advantage. Um, probably we as a society should concentrate on the things that we do best and then trade for everything else that we need. Uh, if we can do that consistently, then we become more productive and also we become richer uh, over time. You know, it doesn't happen. Obviously, there's a great deal of short-term displacement. People lose their jobs in the textile industry and all the other industries that migrated to Mexico and then eventually to China. Um, but in the long run, we're much better off. During the period of the 1990s in the United States, we created 22 million jobs. 
Uh, and now, unfortunately, we're, we're losing some of those jobs that were created, and jobs in every sector. Um, but jobs mo mainly in sectors that we had a comparative advantage in. in in the financial markets, where we did very well during the 1990s, and unfortunately that's all kind of unraveling now. But um, those are the things that we do best in the United States now, services. We're a, a, a country, an economy that's focused on services rather than manufacturing. The Chinese have got it down pat. They know how to manufacture goods for very cheap prices, and we can't compete with that any longer. And if we try to, again, my point about erecting trade barriers in order to protect our own um, domestic, you know, pick an industry, the steel industry, the automobile industry, the pharmaceutical industry, we would hurt ourselves in the long run. We would be paying higher prices. So, there you go. Part of the problem, too, uh, to, that you have, I think you need to take into consideration when looking at something like NAFTA uh, is the entire model of protectionism building up walls around our country so that domestic industry can employ people and we can manufacture our own th products here. Uh, whether uh, you can it's steel and some kind of strategic resource for our own you know, power and safe security, et cetera. Or if it's just some you know, t-shirt manufacturing uh, to protect uh, manufacturing here in the United States. That a basic problem with that model right now is globalization in that it's very hard to identify what would be, say, a United States company. It's very hard to say, let's create protectionist barriers to protect American companies uh, work, uh, manufacturing here in America, forcing them to stay in America, because for the most part, most of these large companies that are going to have any kind of dramatic impact uh, in terms of employment across the country, they're not global companies. Uh, you know, if they haven't already moved their headquarters to Dubai, they're probably going to sometime soon. Uh, and so uh, it's very hard to identify uh, what you're trying to protect in a lot of times. Obviously, it comes down to simply uh, protecting uh, American jobs, making sure we are actually employed in here in something other than agriculture or services, basically. Um, and that's why uh, uh, there's this economist named Robert Reich uh, who has suggested that uh, the comparative advantage that Dr. Samedra is uh, talking about, which doesn't seem to extend anything more beyond more than simply agriculture in this country and certain uh, services because of our infrastructure and the education of, our, of the level of our workforce, um, is the only comparative advantage we could really seek to pursue in this new uh, globalized world is the advantage of our workers. That we simply have to have better workers, more productive workers than those in other countries. Uh, which, of course, I, you know, isn't necessarily the case at the moment. Uh, as much as we want to talk about the, the great productivity of the American worker, it's not necessarily as high as a lot of other countries, and we don't necessarily have a comparative advantage in there. And if we're going to try to create any kind of macro policies, like, say, NAFTA, I personally would say suggest what we really need to do is invest in the quality of American workers and, and as our comparative advantage here. Make companies want to manufacture in the United States. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your presence this evening and your attention. And uh, we hope that you have a good evening. Whoever has those two sign-up books, please give them to me at the end of the session. And also, my students, I'd appreciate if you would hand in the participation. This is GSW-TV, your campus and community connection.